Tanakota Kata. No mai hairi mai. Nei rata mihi koto. O te fari fananga o tamaki makoro. Ena waka, ena hoe fa, ena mana, ena iwi, ena manu korero o te marae. Tena koto, tena koto, tena koto kata. Good evening, and welcome to this. Uh, contribution in the series of the 50, 50th anniversary lecture series of the Faculty of Medical and Health Sciences. Thank you for coming out on an evening like tonight. I'm Alan Merry, and I'm head of the School of Medicine here, and uh, I will be Master of Ceremonies tonight. But before we start the main part, I'd like to introduce Sue Brewster to speak about AMRF. Good evening, everybody, and um, I'll just e echo Alan's words. Um, thank you so much for coming out this evening. It's cold and it's rainy, so you are the brave frontier that has come out tonight, and you will not be disappointed. We've got a fantastic range of presenters um, talking tonight about a whole host of subjects. So. Um, I am from Auckland Medical Research Foundation and we've been very fortunate to partner with the Faculty of Medical and Health Sciences uh, for this lecture series. It's their 50th year celebration. So I'd actually just like to acknowledge uh, distinguished Professor Ian Reid and also Professor John Fraser um, and thank them very much for our partnership and the opportunity to be involved. It's been absolutely invaluable um, and the six lecture series we've had have all been different but um, immensely worthwhile in terms of uh, knowledge and information that's been imparted, so thank you. Um, and I'd all just so like to say that tonight's lecture series includes a whole range of subjects, one of them being diabetes, and if I reflect on where research um, has taken diabetes over the years, it's been hugely significant um, in terms of understanding both type 1 and type 2. But I think I also um, saw something recently which showed how insulin used to be injected. So the things that we used to take, we take for granted is the way that even we administer medication these days, and pharmacology is one of the subjects tonight, has changed so immensely, and that is due to research. So um, for all of our supporters here tonight and everybody who makes that research possible, thank you so much, um, because it does change lives and it brings massive advancements in medicine. Um, and last word on Auckland Medical Research Foundation, for those of you that don't know, we fund medical research. Um, and that's our sole purpose. And uh, due to a generous benefactor giving us all of our administration expenses, 100% of your donation can actually go into medical research. So that's something that people really value uh, for our organisation. So thank you very much for coming tonight. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, say hello, and um, I'm sure you will enjoy all of the wonderful presenters here tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I would just uh, reciprocate with the thanks of the faculty for the support of the AMRF, and my own personal thanks, because I have been a recipient of some of the grant money from time to time. Now the format for this evening is that we have four very distinguished speakers who will each present uh, quite different talks actually, but I think it will work best if we take the four talks and then they'll come up as a panel and we'll have a chance to have questions on any of them at the end. So if you have burning questions during any of the presentations, just make a note of them and we'll deal with them at the end. So the first of our speakers tonight is Professor Sally Merry. Professor Merry is a child and adolescent psychiatrist, the Cure Kids Duke Family Chair in Child and Adolescent Mental Health, and the head of the Department of Psychological Medicine in the faculty. Professor Merry is interested in the development and implementation of effective therapies in child and adolescent mental health including computerized mobile phone-based interventions. And she's going to talk to us on 
bits, bots, and beyond the promise of challenge and technology in improving mental health. Sally. Um, thank you, Alan, and uh, um, greetings to everybody. Um, Tanakoto Katoa, Talofa Lava, Maloa Lele, warm Pacifica greetings, warm Māori greetings, and warm greetings to uh, all our varied um, population in New Zealand. It's a great pleasure and honour to be here tonight, and I'm going to talk to you about bits and bots and the promise and, and challenges of using technology. And I guess one of the questions that's, that um, people say to me is, you're a child psychiatrist, you shouldn't be using technology, we're supposed to be getting our kids off phones, we're supposed to be getting them off computers, we're supposed to be getting them to exercise more, to interact more. Aren't you worried about the uh, difficulties about that? For me, technology is a two-edged sword. And I think the first question is, why use technology anyway? And I've been an advocate for this for many a long year. And for me, the reason is that 13 to 20% of young people have a mental disorder in one year and less than half of this gets treated. Imagine if less than half of our young people with asthma or with diabetes was treated. Imagine the outcry, and yet we leave our young people with mental health problems without the help they need. We've got U US figures on the lack of treatment, but this is also borne out in New Zealand, and in New Zealand, the secondary mental health services are funded only for the 3% of young people with the most severe mental health problems. On the other hand, New Zealanders are early adopters, and by the middle of last year, there were 3.8 million mobile phones with active internet connections. And we know that young people are on phones. We know because it's driving us crazy because we keep telling them to switch their phones off. We also know that it's spread around the country and that it's actually spread very widely. So including for Māori and Pacific people, some of the people who have the biggest disparities in mental health. So my story with this, and I'd like to share a little bit about this, actually goes back to 2003. I had a conversation with a GP friend of mine many years ago who was picking up mental health problems in her general practice and couldn't find therapists to see the young people she was seeing. And she said to me, I think you should take cognitive behavioral therapy, one of the um, evidence-based therapies, particularly for depression and anxiety, and put it onto a CD-ROM so that I can run it in my office. And I had a PhD student um, who's now Dr. Carolina Stasiak, um, who's a very able and uh, quite charismatic researcher. And she set out to make a very early prototype using a flash-based um, program to put uh, CBT onto a CD-ROM. And she, she also created a um, education program and she did a randomized controlled pilot trial to compare the two and showed that the journey worked. So all well and good, except that she got uh, feedback from the young people who said, well, this is okay, but actually it's quite boring compared with the games that we play, and they had a whole list of things that they thought, thought that they wanted us to do to improve it. So we're very fortunate to be able to then have this to take to the Ministry of Health, who then funded the development of a serious game, and we set out to create Sparks. And what we wanted to do here was to address some of the difficulties that they had identified. So we wanted to make it immersive, we wanted to make it like the games of the day, we wanted to use a fantasy game format, uh, we wanted to make it very engaging. We drew not only on gaming technology but also on e-learning theory and we particularly drew on something called a bicentric frame of reference, which was proposed by Didi, which actually says that you can learn by emotion, but you learn better still if you can actually step back and make sense of it. So we landed up with a two-phased game, and you can actually see that this here, you will be looking at the guide, and the guide is looking straight back at you. So this is a first-person game. And the guide interacts with the young person, and he will... Um, provide opportunity for screening, he will provide psychoeducation, he will provide challenges in the real world. He also provides choice so that young people can screen to see whether or not they've got problems that are likely to be helped by Sparks. And then he offers them a choice, would you like to play this game or would you like to do something else and offers options if they do. 
If they choose the game, it then goes into a third-person format. So you can see here they can actually choose the avatar. The avatar is customizable by skin color, hair color, hairstyles, the trim on the clothes, and so on. And then the avatar enters a, um, a fantasy world in which there are a number of challenges. And the goal in this world is to, the world is beset with gnats, um, which are gloomy negative automatic thoughts, and they need to be guarded by a circle of power. The circle of power has been destroyed, the gems are scattered to the four corners of the, the earth, and your job is to go and find the gems and restore the circle of power. And to do so, you go through different provinces, and each one of these is loosely linked to the cognitive behavioral therapy construct. So you deal with unhelpful thoughts and with um, unhelpful emotions, you overcome problems. Along the way, you uh, find some gnats, which are gloomy negative automatic thoughts, and you get to fight those. Uh, the young men that we were co-designing with really wanted to shoot stuff. We didn't want anybody to die in a game for depression, so, um, <laughs> so we thought we, that they could shoot the gnats. Um, and also catch sparks, smart, positive, active, realistic X-Factor thoughts. Having developed this, we then wanted to test it to make sure it worked, and so we did a randomized controlled trial, and we were very thrilled. We were quite a small research team, or were then, um, and uh, we're very thrilled when it was accepted by the British Medical Journal, and they liked us so much they put us on the front cover. Now, I think until that point, we'd really thought that, you know, we're in a tiny little country at the end of the world, and Silicon Valley's probably doing it better, but we attracted a huge amount of international interest, and we actually realized at that point that we were a bit ahead of the curve. We won some international awards, we got quite a lot of media coverage, and we were feeling like the bee's knees. However, no sooner had we done this than the technology started to date, and we had to move it very quickly from the CD-ROM, does anybody, can everybody remember those even, onto the internet, um, particularly because at the time, the Prime Minister, John Key, had a youth mental health project, and he wanted to launch it as a national program. And it was launched in April of 2014 and has been running and is available free of charge in New Zealand um, just on the internet. You can, you can, get, you can get it by, um, by just searching for Sparks. Uh, and uh, since then, we've been collecting data on its usage. And since it was released, more than 18,000 people have accessed the website, and we've been able to keep those, uh, those um, web views uh, going because we've been iterating as we've actually been going. And built into Sparks is a, is a system to actually see whether or not it keeps working. So this is the PHQA, which is a measure of depression that's built into Sparks. We built this from people with mild to moderate depression. We thought that people with moderately severe and severe depression should actually go and see somebody, but you can actually see here that the no symptoms don't change much, you would expect that, and no, neither do the mild. The um, moderate, uh, people with moderate depression improve, but the people with moderately <coughs> severe and severe depression improve the most, which was a bit of a surprise to us, and a bit reassuring because at least half our users are in the moderately severe to severe group. So that, that was all great, and if you remember when I started, when we, when we set out to develop this, we wanted something that would be really exciting and enthuse young people, and uh, we wanted this sort of reaction. The sad news is that we didn't quite get it. Although we got really good completion rates within the trials, in the wild it, doesn't, it isn't the same, and we get quite a big drop-off at each module, so about two-thirds of people who do each module do the next one, so that by... Uh, level four, we've got about 11% of people uh, completing. And I guess perhaps we shouldn't have been surprised at this if you think about the number of people who take up gym memberships and don't follow through, the number of people who don't finish their antibiotic courses and so on. But I think that's one of the challenges is going forward to make it more sticky, to use the parlance. The other big challenge is the design um, uh, cycle. So we started in 2003. We actually designed Sparks in 2008. We were going quite fast to get the national rollout in 2014, but we've had to really work hard to try and keep up with technology. And we've released a mobile phone version now, but we're getting a lot of feedback that this is looking like a 2008-style game. And the way that you interact on, um, uh, on phones is actually really quite different from how you interact on computers. And so I'd like to spend the second half of the talk 
actually talking about where are we going to go to from here and what might we think about. And we've been very fortunate to be part of one of the National Science Challenges, very fortunate and also somewhat challenged because it's quite a difficult funding process, but it has actually given us um, access to funding to allow us to think longer term. And um, the, these, these uh, challenges are funded by the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment, and the idea here is that researchers from across New Zealand get together to collaborate to tackle some of the big problems in New Zealand. The problems being tackled here in a better start, a tupu are obesity, literacy, and youth mental health, and the use of big data to inform better care. And so we've got in this habits, health approaches through behavioral intervention technologies. And our vision is that we would create a, a go-to IT ecosystem to improve health and well-being for young people. A sort of trade me of health and well-being for young people that's known within New Zealand as the place to go. We've got the important thing from this is the platform and this hosts things like online screening to see if people have actually got difficulty that could then provide ongoing, ongoing referral to face-to-face -face therapy or could provide um, a range of apps, a smorgasbord of apps that might help various problems uh, that could then be monitored. To combat the problem of rapid development, we could do rapid online RCTs. And then we can also link to the national databases, particularly the integrated data infrastructure, which has been created by Stats New Zealand, to look at the longer term impact of some of these interventions. Co-design is really important. We started off co-designing with young people, but we now realize that co-design is a much wider process and it's really important to be thinking about how does it sit in current health services? What, is the what are the government priorities? What about families and communities? Um, and that we need to really co-design with developers and learn from them. This is a little group from a, a lovely group of young people from One Tree Hill College who've been helping us with the design of our new apps. And in the corner there is uh, Tony Patolo, who's a Pacific uh, research assistant. We've got two Pacific and one Maori, so we're also trying to support development of the workforce in one of our co-design workshops. We've, decide, we've discovered that young people are different users. So depending on how old they are and whether or not they have symptoms, they want different interfaces. So we've actually got players or gamers, young people, who, would, who are pretty much engaging, you know, like 11, 12, 13-year-olds, pretty happy to engage as long as you've got a game interface. In contrast, older adolescents who might have symptoms, you say, cut out that game rubbish, we don't want any games, just tell us like it is, and then we can put some help in, yeah, then, then we know what to do. So what we're working on is youth chat for screening. This is an online screening that can be used in schools to identify young people with difficulties. And we've carried out a feasibility study comparing it with HEADS, which is an interview. And we've actually shown that it's very effective and efficient. Young people like it, so do school nurses. It helps them to triage better. We've actually built, we're on our second prototype of the platform and um, we've got a lot of functionality in there and we're looking to link it to uh, the big data project and to this integrated data infrastructure. And we've got this whole suite of apps here. We've got Play Kindly and Super Kids for parents of young children, preschoolers. We've got Karkano, which is a project in Christchurch following the um, difficulties, some of the young children there have ongoing mental health problems and the parents want extra help. That's five to 12 year olds. We've got an app and a chatbot for mental health and an app to decrease risky behavior. And these are all being developed and we're trying to run clinical trials for these over the next 18 months or so. To give you an idea about it, what, what it looks like, Te Fiti Yanga, the Quest is our app for emotional health and this is the relaxation module. In this you go from island to island, again, doing various things that you can actually do on your phone and um, earning money and being on a leaderboard and things. Not real money, money in the game. Um, this is Headstrong, which is a chatbot, and, and I didn't even know what chatbots were, but um, apparently you access, you, you, you can get, um, you can download these on your phone, but they can also <coughs> enter things like Messenger. So tracking where young people are and what they're using is actually quite a challenge. And so we're using chatbot for 15 to 18 year olds. These are sort of the more skeptical young people with a cast of characters to represent young people in New Zealand. And this will give us in the future the opportunity to use machine learning and artificial intelligence to further develop these things. 
This is Play Kindly, which is a project that we've been doing linked in with the Pacifica Group. And I don't know if you'll recognise, but this is actually Oscar <laughs> Kitely who's been involved in this project. And this is actually to support parents of young children. And this is Kākano. This is the Christchurch project that we've actually been doing. We need to integrate it into services, which I've talked about before, and we've been thinking about how is this going to link into communities, how is it going to link into health services, how will it link into schools. So what I'd like to do is finish by actually showing you a little video that we've actually got that gives you an idea about how we see it in practice in schools using our youth chat screening. And I hope... That this is going it's to common for young stuff. people to feel stressed out or down. Mental health problems affect at least one in four young people. There's about seven students in an average sized New Zealand class. Over half of these young people don't get the support they need because they find it hard to ask for help and access services. Habits is a secure web and mobile space where young people can access digital screening and intervention tools for mental health and wellbeing. It's based on proven strategies that work for young New Zealanders. So, how does it work? Meet Edna. She's just started high school. Edna is nervous about being at a new school. Edna lives at home with her whānau. Like many families, they don't always see eye to eye, and Edna finds it hard to talk about what's going on. All of these worries are adding up, and she feels down a lot of the time. Sometimes she cries in her room alone at night. She doesn't know what to do and where to go for help. So, where does Habits come in? Edna's school has signed up to use Habits, and all Year 9 students are trying it out. Edna starts with Check It, answering a few questions about how things are going for her. Once she's filled it all in, Habits responds with feedback on her scores and gives her some options to move forward. The school nurse gets reports on all the Year 9s who have completed Check It. Edna's results show that she's feeling down, and so the school nurse makes a time to see her. The nurse and Edna have a talk about what's going on at home and school. They work together on what might help, including choosing some support people. Edna chooses to tell her dad about habits. Edna agrees to try one of the Habits apps. They start the app together. It looks helpful, and Edna decides to keep using the app at home on her phone. At the end of the activity, Edna has the option to share her progress with her support people. Edna likes using the app and decides to check out what else is on Habits' site. She finds other apps that look helpful, and bit by bit, she starts to feel better. By using Habits, Edna's school have been able to identify other students who are having a hard time and support them to get help via the apps, the school nurse and other options. The research from the Habits team can use anonymous data to improve the apps. That way they can help more and more young people to flourish with the support of digital technologies. Obviously I haven't done this on my own. I'd like to acknowledge our Komato Rauri Faramate who has stepped um, each step of this way along with me, and my wonderful research team, who are enormous, and I'd just like to acknowledge um, all our funders. Um, and what isn't here, but we actually have a, a uh, co-funding project with AMRF as well uh, within this. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Sally. That's a great start to the evening. Our second speaker tonight is Associate Professor Rinky Murphy. Rinky Murphy is an endocrinologist who works in Auckland and Counties DHB. She's an Associate Professor in Medicine at the University of Auckland and a Principal Investigator at the Morris Wilkins Centre for Molecular Biodiscovery, a National Centre of Research Excellence. Rinky's research in diabetes and obesity spans genetics, physio physiology, and clinical research. Rinky is going to speak to us tonight on diabetes and obesity when one size does not fit all. Rinky Murphy. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Malo alele, uh, namaste, greetings to you all. Um, I'm delighted to be able to speak with you tonight on diabetes and obesity, two of the biggest health challenges to face um, New Zealanders. So if I could just turn the projector on. Oh, perfect. So, um, 
We all uh, are aware of obesity. Um, we're not particularly proud of being on the top of the leaderboard for obesity uh, around um, the world. Uh, we are third in place, second to Mexico and United States. Uh, this is in selected countries in 2009. And since then, our obesity rates have actually continued to rise um, from about 10% in the late 1970s to almost a third of our adults being obese in recent times. We're concerned about obesity because of all the host of medical complications from lung disease, fatty liver, coronary artery disease, diabetes, and certain cancers. And the uh, impacts it has on quality of life uh, health care and quantity of life as well. So we're aware of the environmental drivers of obesity in terms of the availability of uh, high caloric uh, density of foods and, um, and mechanisation and automation in the home and in the workforce that, mean, that displaces the need for human labour. Uh, transportation, communication and um, electronic devices uh, that all favour us to um, consuming more and spending less calories. To some extent, those of us who are financially better off are able to um, shield ourselves to, from this obesogenic uh, environment to some extent by um, making time for uh, physical activity and, um, and being able to prepare uh, nutritious foods of lower caloric um, density. However, it's not a level playing field for other reasons in terms of obesity in that there is um, alterations in our genetic susceptibility to obesity such that um, from uh, various international studies of hundreds and thousands of people who have had um, uh, genetic analysis of their um, uh, genes show that people who are obese tend to have uh, variation in their genes that uh, control satiety or that feeling of fullness in the brain. And so what we can conclude from that is that certain people are more predisposed genetically to overeating in, in the same uh, environmental um, influences. When we look at obesity treatments, um, for, for quite some time we've focused on uh, personal efforts to um, exercise and to eat um, uh, differently and in order to lose weight. There are several commercial weight loss programs like um, Jenny Craig's and Weight Watchers. There's also a range of very low calorie diets and meal replacements that can help, as well as medications and bariatric surgery. So these are two of the common forms of bariatric surgery where you can see that the stomach is either disconnected from the passage of food or the Ruin Y bypass or a sleeve gastrectomy where the majority of the stomach is removed. And most of these obesity treatments, unfortunately, are very difficult to sustain and maintain and achieve weight loss. And this is because of the strong biological mechanisms that we have to defend weight loss. And to some extent, the master regulator is in the brain in terms of integrating signals from the gut from other organs such as the pancreas and the fat itself that tells us when um, the fat stores are adequate. And any efforts to decrease meal frequency and size are met with a whole host of adaptations that serve to regain uh, weight back to what, what it was. And to some extent that is mediated by genetic influences such that some people have stronger um, uh, adaptations to uh, defending weight loss than others. So I think obesity can be, uh, should be seen as a disease and it's not simply uh, a lack of willpower that means that some people aren't able to lose weight and it should have the same degree of empathy as we have for other diseases. Um, and so with that I'd like to turn to diabetes and, and the prevalence of that in diabetes in New Zealand which is also rising at uh, a similar rate uh, to obesity. So. In the last 12 years, it's increased from about 140,000 people in New Zealand to well over 250,000 in New Zealand in most recent times. Diabetes is defined as a blood glucose above a threshold at which um, the blood vessels are um, likely to get blocked, and hence the um, organs that they supply are at risk of complications. So the cutoff for diabetes is a fasting blood glucose above seven, or a, a random um, marker of glucose in the blood called HbA1c and a level above 50. 
And beyond that, uh, there is a risk of um, microvascular complications uh, that lead to uh, retinopathy or blindness, uh, kidney disease, neuropathy, and medium-sized blood vessels in, in the brain causing strokes, heart disease, and peripheral vascular disease. And the, and the um, good news, though, in, in, in diabetes is that there are several glucose-lowering treatments such that people who are able to control their blood glucose are able to lower their risk uh, of these complications pretty effectively. The range of um, treatments, however, in terms of diet, exercise, a whole host of um, tablets and insulin and even bariatric surgery, their effects vary by the types of diabetes. And it's important to distinguish between type 1 and type 2 diabetes as the two main subtypes. In type 1 diabetes, which is actually uh, causes about 5% of adult cases of diabetes, and the predominant cause of diabetes in childhood, is due to a loss of insulin production in the pancreas. So this can occur at any body weight, not linked with physical activity or diet, and, uh, and really the replacement of insulin is the only treatment. For type 2 diabetes, which affects the majority, 90% of adult cases with diabetes, the risks of these increase with age and increase with increased body, um, body fat. Gestational diabetes has a similar etiology to type 2 diabetes, affects 5 to 8% of women in their pregnancies, and is generally associated with excess body fat. The diabetes generally goes away after the baby is born, but those women are at higher risk of having developing type 2 diabetes later in life. There's a number of other very rare specific types which we don't have time to go into, but it's important not to think that everyone in adults has type 2 diabetes. Just a bit of physiology on how blood glucose is regulated. Here, the master regulator is an organ called the pancreas. And this senses blood glucose, high blood glucose, particularly after a meal, and so that it releases insulin in response to the glucose, insulin being the key hormone that signals to the muscle and fat cells to take up the glucose and restore normal blood glucose levels. In type 1 diabetes, the specific insulin-producing cells in the pancreas are destroyed usually through an autoimmune process, and there's a uh, genetic susceptibility with certain HLA or other autoimmune type genes, as well as a second trigger, usually a viral trigger, is thought to, uh, uh, to destroy those, um, those beta pancreatic cells. And, and that leads to um, progressively high blood glucose, which is actually treated by insulin that needs to be injected intermittently or infused through a, a, an insulin pump and one of the um, uh, difficulties with uh, insulin treatment in type 1 diabetes is the need to sample blood glucose in order to judge the right amount of insulin to give. And with recent advances in technology, there are some um, better ways of monitoring diabetes and administering those. However, these are very expensive at the present time, and we do hope that that will reduce um, over the years. In contrast, type 2 diabetes is actually affects the muscle and fat cells in there, uh, which become more resistant to the effects of insulin, and hence they don't um, take up um, blood glucose, uh, the glucose well. There are also other defects in the pancreas, for example, and other organs in terms of uh, controlling blood glucose levels. And these multiple defects arise largely from an excess of fat cells, and they have, again, a genetic predisposition with uh, reduced pancreas um, function to produce insulin, as well as environmental um, uh, causes that determine um, uh, weight gain. And to treat the multiple defects in type 2 diabetes, we have a range of um, medications to lower blood glucose, as well as insulin and bariatric surgery, which are very powerful ways of um, treating type 2 diabetes. However, to, at this point, we don't have any tailored treatments for the type 2 diabetes medications. And what we uh, are thinking about currently is that whether certain medications, such as valdegliptin, might be more effective in people who have a weaker pancreas and ability to produce insulin in type 2 diabetes, whilst alternative medications, such as pioglitazone, may, um, may be more effective in people in whom uh, are, are more obese and have high blood uh, lipid levels or cholesterol levels. And we're aiming to test this in by recruiting 
um, people who, with type 2 diabetes who are willing to try these uh, two different medications in succession to measure how well they control blood glucose according to characteristics measuring insulin production and, uh, and lipid levels and um, body fat mass. So we're aiming to work out whether we can predict glucose-lowering response to certain diabetes medications using these characteristics and to compare them with various genetic factors as well as uh, variation by ethnicity uh, and in order to improve uh, the ability to treat people with type 2 diabetes in a more personalised way. And one of the interesting factors by ethnicity is how obesity and diabetes differs in New Zealand in different ethnic groups. So in this graph here, you can see that obesity prevalence is highest in Pacific people. In the green bar here, where almost two-thirds of adults uh, have obesity. Whereas in the yellow bar here, you can see that Asian, uh, Asians and Indians have the lowest prevalence of, of obesity in about 12%. We have intermediate levels in Māori at almost 50% and 25% uh, in Europeans. However, when we turn to type 2 diabetes, which we know is related to body fat, um, the levels um, increase with uh, age, but we see the highest prevalence of diabetes is affecting Pacific and Indians in the orange. So green and orange refer to Pacific people and Indian people, and the lowest risk is that in New Zealand Europeans. The red bar refers to those of um, Māori uh, ethnicity. And it's um, interesting as to why this might be. And, and much of this is thought to be due to ethnic differences in body fat. So when we talk about obesity, we usually talk about a BMI or a, or a weight adjusted by height measurement of 30. And this corresponds in Europeans, in the blue line, uh, to a body fat of 28%. So basically this is a graph inviting people of different ethnicities and measuring their body fat and relating it to their height and weight measurements. And you can see in the blue cluster that refers to Europeans, and there's quite a lot of variation from one individual to another, but overall uh, the, 30, um, the threshold of height to weight of 30 corresponds to about 28% body fat. When we look in other ethnic groups, particularly Asian Indians, this a threshold of 28% body fat is reached at a much earlier or lower BMI, so a lower weight for height. In contrast, Pacific people have uh, reached 28% body fat at a much higher BMI weight for height. And this is likely to be genetically determined and there are individual variations uh, according to how well people are able to store body fat versus muscle mass versus bone mass at any particular weight. This highlights the limitations of measuring obesity and how we define it. Uh, in, in simplistic terms, we use weight and height, which are easy to measure. And you can each work out your own BMI by taking your weight in kilograms and dividing it by your height in metres, squaring that. Uh, and if your BMI is over 30, that's an estimate of obesity. That just indicates that you are likely uh, to carry excess body fat. However, this doesn't apply to all ethnicities, and, the, uh, and whilst we may use judgments on the street uh, of who might be obese and who might not, these aren't always reliable in terms of, uh, of metabolic health. Many of our All Blacks, if we use the same weight and height threshold of 30 to classify obesity, they would be obese, but in fact their body fat percentage would actually, is actually quite low, and, and that determines uh, metabolic health and type 2 diabetes, which is not easy to measure without doing more um, uh, expensive tests, um, ideally MR, MRI scans or body fat scanners. In contrast, this woman here, you probably if you met her on the streets, you'd think she was quite slim, but she happens to have a genetic um, a defect that means that even at a low BMI, she has very high liver and pancreatic fat and, and has developed type 2 diabetes at a very young age. So, um, so there are some um, important uh, caveats to how we assess obesity. 
One of the things that we've been looking at in our research is, uh, is to look at the genetic susceptibility to obesity in Māori and Pacific people living in New Zealand, and just over 2,200 people have donated um, blood samples to look at uh, genetic variants that predispose to obesity. And what we've identified recently is that a particular um, coding change in a gene called CREBRF, where there's an A instead of a G, is present in 30% of Māori and Pacific people. This gene variant is not found in any other ethnic group um, that's been studied across the world. And what this A instead of G gene change means is those carriers are heavier, approximately four kilos um, per copy of that uh, gene. And surprisingly, even though they're heavier, they have a 40% lower risk of type two diabetes. So that is really interesting. It brings us to uh, doing further studies which are currently underway to assessing what this CREBRF gene uh, variant means in terms of uh, muscle mass, in terms of hormones regulating appetite, in terms of body composition and so forth. So we hope that this information will help us tailor uh, the um, BMI guidelines and uh, weight and uh, type two diabetes risk for uh, populations in New Zealand. So to summarise, I'd like to leave you with the message that not all people of the same body size have the same risk of diabetes, and that, that there are genetic differences between ethnicities and between individuals um, as to how much and where we store our body fat and in terms of what types of diabetes we are at risk of. So thank you very much for your attention. Fantastic lecture. Thank you very much, Rinky. And uh, I'll just be careful not to suggest to one of the All Blacks that they're obese. This is uh, <laughs> quite, a, quite an insightful point. Our third speaker is Associate Professor Jeff Harrison. Jeff is a hospital pharmacist by training, latterly specialising in cardiovascular intensive care medicine. Originally from England, Jeff was awarded a PhD in surgery. Quite an unusual path for a pharmacist, perhaps, but went on to train in evidence-based medicine at McMaster University in Canada. He moved to New Zealand in 2001, taking up the post of senior lecturer at the University of Auckland in 2005, and became head of School of Pharmacy in 2016. His primary research interests are cardiovascular disease, diabetes, comparative effectiveness research, and pharmacoepidemiology. He's going to talk tonight on people, not potions, the reprofessionalization of pharmacy. Thanks, Alan. Um, I'm delighted to be speaking to you today. Um, today of all days, actually. Um, Ian, you probably didn't realize that today is World Pharmacist Day, so couldn't be more appropriate. Um, just in a little bit of a change of pace, what I'm going to talk to you about today is about um, the profession of pharmacy, but I will, towards the end, be talking a little bit about research and arguing that um, the profession itself is the intervention that we should be uh, interested in, um, in applying to our, our patients. So when I say pharmacy, you probably think of this. The dude, maybe he's not a dude, the gentleman standing behind the counter handing out pills. Or maybe for some of the older people in the audience, maybe you think of this. But there's a serious point behind that particular slide as well. So what I'm going to talk about today is where pharmacy came from, where we are now, and where we should be going as, uh, as an intervention to improve the health and wellness of New Zealanders. So hold that image in your mind. So pharmacy and medicine have a long and interdependent history. And in fact, that was recognized by um, Professor Lewis when first setting up the medical school um, all those years, 50 years ago, when he envisioned that the faculty would have a school of pharmacy and a school of nursing, that unholy alliance. Um, but this um, pairing of medicine and pharmacy has been around um, since prehistoric times, pre-written history times. Um, and in fact, this stone that you see here um, is found in Ephesus in Turkey and 
dates from the 10th century. And what you're looking at here is actually a mortar and pestle. And there's a matching stone on the other side, um, which represents the staff of Aesculops, which is the symbol of medicine. And so they're often seen as a pair. And I've heard an economist in the last two weeks argue that without pharmacy, medicine wouldn't exist. Um, but I think that might be stretching a little far in this audience. <laughs> but pharmacy has been around for a very long time. The first prescription, first written prescription, was recorded in 1550 BC. And if you look at different parts of the world, similar timelines of the evolution of pharmacy have, have been recognised. And in fact, the state's been involved for a very long time as well. The first record of a state-controlled pharmacy um, heralds from Baghdad in Iraq. So a long history of medicine and pharmacy together. So where does pharmacy come from? So the modern pharmacist, as we know them, um, has taken over the role of the apothecary as was, who was a, a medical professional who formulated and dispensed um, products from Materia Medica, that is, the, the herbs, the plants, the roots, um, that were then used by the physicians, the surgeons, and their patients. So, as well as dispensing herbs and medicines, the apothecary also offered general medical advice. There's a story developing. And a range of services that are now, we see, performed um, by doctors. In a British view of this, um, there's an event in 1704 where apothecary, apothecaries divided into what we now know as general practitioners who treat patients and what we now know as pharmacists who prepare the medicines. And the case went that um, an apothecary was sued by the College of Physicians in the High Court for having the brass neck of visiting a patient at home, um, prescribing and dispensing medicine for that patient. Uh, the College of Physicians felt that this was completely inappropriate and, and took the apothecary to court. Unfortunately for the college, the court agreed with the apothecary largely on the basis that this was custom and practice, that physicians were rare and charged too much. <laughs> There's an interesting parallel with today where pharmacists are now uh, working in general practices, seeing patients, prescribing treatments and dispensing medicines. Uh, not this time because general practitioners are too expensive, but they are too few. So this is one of the emerging roles of the modern pharmacist. So what then happened? So we had apothecaries, pharmacists emerge from that. What's happened since then? Well, there's been technological change. When we think about medicines, we no longer think, most of us, no longer think about compounded herbs. We think about the tablets that Rinky showed you, the injections. So industrial pharmacy led to the creation of pharmaceuticals as products as we know them to be distributed by pharmacists. That specialist knowledge that pharmacists held about how to make drugs became uh, lost from the high street where it had been. Remember thinking back to the Victorian pharmacy? That was where the pharmacist compounded products for an individual patient. They made a consultation, decided what the patient needed, compounded it there and then, and sold it to them, a professional service. Whereas now, increasingly, pharmacists were seen as distributors of products that were ready prepared. Pharmacists remain the medicine's expert, but their daily activities, the daily activities of being a pharmacist, are perceived to be the distribution of a product. This, unfortunately, hides the real role, because what goes along with handing that box of medicine to you is the assessment of whether that's the right medicine for you, whether it's the right dose, whether it is in the right formulation for the individual. But I would argue that the profession has had a little bit of a crisis of confidence around its professional identity and what it's there to perform. And I think some of the profession and some of the, the public's perception of what pharmacy is has been, has been caught up in that. So when I say pharmacy, what I think is this. And you'll notice in these images, yes, in one of the images, there's a product or a row of products behind. But what I actually see is pharmacists interacting with people. And I think this is really what we're seeing, starting to emerge again, is the value of the pharmacist and the pharmacist knowledge, no longer about the product, but about the interaction with the person and about um, ensuring that the right individual therapy um, 
for that patient. And I see one of my colleagues in the room who's um, a, a brilliant example of a community pharmacy, a high street pharmacy that, that provides all of these services right now. The value of this emerging role has been recognised by governments. Um, they've started to talk about not valuing the distribution of medicines. You may know, for those of you who read the papers, that um, Amazon has just spent a billion dollars in acquiring a distribution network for pharmaceutical products in the US. Um, it was interesting to read Sydney Morning Herald's response to that, which was, there's going to be a crisis uh, in Australia, in Australian pharmacies, and Amazon is going to take over. There are two reasons why that's not going to happen. One of which is to do with GST being charged in, to Amazon in Australia, and the other is the fact that Australia and New Zealand have fundamentally different healthcare systems to the US, and there's less money to be made from the distribution of medicines in that way. But that sort of technological change, I think, will be empowering for pharmacists. Pharmacists are now moving to, and this is the research part of the presentation, pharmacists are now moving to providing um, patients professional services, extended services. And I'm just going to talk to you a, um, a few examples from my own area of interest, cardiovascular disease and diabetes. So there have now been 39 randomised controlled trials of pharmacist-led management for hypertension as opposed to general practitioner-led management of hypertension. When comparing those two interventions, with a pharmacist, without a pharmacist, um, you see an average systolic blood pressure reduction of 7.6 millimetres of mercury. That's better than any single drug. Where pharmacists are able to not only just assess the patient and make recommendations to the general practitioner, but they're actually able to enact that change themselves, you see an average reduction in blood pressure, systolic blood pressure of nearly 20 millimetres of mercury. That's extraordinary. So this big change in, in, um, in blood pressure, how does that translate in terms of patient outcomes? So there have been some studies done looking at how many strokes that would save, how many heart attacks that would save, and also whether that would be cost effective. Clearly you've got to pay the pharmacist to run this service, right? And you're already paying GPs, so by adding a layer of cost, that's going to cost more. But what that analysis shows, not only is the treatment being the pharmacist more effective, it's actually more cost effective as well. And it's been said that it would be unethical not to fund this. If this was a drug, we would have general practitioners lobbying the Minister of Health, we'd have the general public uh, in the street demanding that Pharmac paid for it and yet it's not funded here and it's considered to be something that we don't necessarily want to do. Um, again, I've heard it said it would be unethical not to fund a service like this. Similarly, there have been randomised controlled trials of pharmacist-led care versus usual care for diabetes management, specifically around glycemic control using existing treatments. So not new treatments, just using the treatments we have better. And an average reduction in that study of nearly 1%, or 10 millimoles per mole in the HbA1c. And as Rinky showed you, that translates directly into um, reductions in retinopathy, reductions in nephropathy, cardiovascular events. There was also an attendant reduction in blood pressure and associated uh, lipid levels, LDL cholesterol and triglycerides, that often go alongside um, poor glycemic control as well. And that directly translates into improved patient outcomes. Again, this is just adding the pharmacist as an intervention to the existing healthcare system. And then talk a little bit about uh, anticoagulation management. So many of you will have come across, you'll know somebody on warfarin, you might even have taken it yourself or used it to kill rats, one or the other. Um, is a commonly used medicine. Um, it has some interesting pharmacokinetics and interesting pharmacodynamics. So different people need different doses, but the same person will need a different dose from time to time as well. So they're quite comp it's a quite a complicated drug to use. When pharmacists, and Marie was one of them who in, in the pilot study, when pharmacists see patients and manage warfarin, as opposed to general practitioners, 
outcomes improve. What this graph shows is this is the distribution of um, blood test results. So you may have seen or heard of an INR. So an I, we, if you're not taking warfarin, your INR would typically be about one. So normal clotting. The higher the number, the longer it takes your blood to clot. Ideally, when you're treating somebody with warfarin, you should be aiming for an INR of about two and a half. Somewhere between two and three is acceptable. Above three, the patient is at risk of bleeding side effects. Below two, they're at risk of, uh, of clotting, abnormal clotting, which might cause a stroke, heart attack, or, or a blood clot in the leg, a DVT. So this is the di distribution of the amount of time that an individual spends in the correct range, in that range of two to three. This is usual care what happens in most of New Zealand. This is what happens when you put a pharmacist in charge of selecting the dose and tailoring the dose to the individual. Ideally, the international gold standard would be to spend more than 60% of time in the correct range. So what you see here is, turns out, pharmacists are quite good at this. There's an increase in the time in therapeutic range of nearly 17%. Importantly, there's a 15% increase, or oh, sorry, 15% decrease in the amount of time a patient spends below the required therapeutic range at risk of stroke. But also, there is a reduction in the amount of time that the patient spends in the bleeding risk, in the above three level as well. So why is it that pharmacists are good at this? Turns out, we're pretty good at pharmacology. Now, there may be a haematologist in the room. There's not a lot that I could tell a haematologist about how warfarin works. Um, you know, that's, that's their area of expertise. They will understand that um, there is genetic variation in VCOR C1, uh, particularly amongst um, Asian populations, which means that the variation in dose is about 30% due to that one gene alone. They'll also understand that the way warfarin is metabolized uh, through 2D6 has a genetic variation that's responsible for about 10% of that change in dose. I'm not going to tell a haematologist much about how warfarin works. Turns out, though, warfarin has lots of drug interactions. It also interacts with lots of foods, including turmeric, which probably not a lot of, of haematologists would know just off the top of their head. Turns out pharmacists are pretty good at pharmacology. And that's why when things go wrong or when the patient has a complicated drug therapy, we are in a position to perhaps make uh, better judgments about whether to adjust the dose or whether not to. It may be to do with the fact that we also have more time. We don't just have those six minute consultations that GPs unfortunately uh, seem to have to manage through. This service has been funded um, across New Zealand and there are about 8,500 patients that are currently in this service but there are about 30,000 patients on warfarin so there is a shortfall. So there are a number of people that are not getting this service. Again, I would argue, uh, Marie I'm sure has got a waiting list for her CPAM service um, and I know, certainly know um, there are areas in the country that are not served in this way. So everything old is new again. Pharmacy is in an exciting transition phase. Pharmacy professions always talking about being at the crossroads. Um, I sometimes feel that it's a roundabout um, rather than a crossroads. But there has been a shift from a product focus to a patient focus. Pharmacies are harnessing technologies to automate some of those processes around dispensing. So dispensing robots that can um, reduce time and cost in getting the product to the patient which then allows the pharmacist to spend time talking with the patient, identifying their problems and individualising their therapy. The profession is also recapturing its space as the medicines experts. We've talked a little bit about pot potentially different responses to different treatments based on an individual's genetic profile or predisposition. Integrative medicine, I don't know whether you know what that means. Integrative medicine is really combining traditional therapies, maybe traditional Chinese medicine, Rongwa, Pacific medicines, with what we lovingly term as 
Western medicines. Often patients want to be able to take both together. In order to be able to do that safely, we need pharmacists and pharmacologists to be able to understand how those two approaches to treatment interact. Pharmacists therefore become those knowledge brokers, there to support their um, medical and nursing colleagues and others, and specifically their patients in understanding and using existing therapies better. Just very briefly, what do pharmacists study? When I went to university, I studied all the things on the left. Uh, we did a lot of physiology, immunology, pathophysiology, pharmacology in spades. I did two solid years of pharmacology. What I didn't do, I didn't do any patient assessment. I didn't learn clinical reasoning until I was treating patients and having to work it out. Critical thinking, I could think, hopefully I did a bit of critical thinking. I didn't learn anything about communication skills. I didn't learn anything about um, uh, behavioral therapies. Um, we're actually starting to teach our students right now these skills. I didn't learn anything about teamwork until a Thursday night in the butter market in Shrewsbury when I had to interact with my medical and nursing colleagues over half a pint of mild. We do, I did learn about evidence-based practice and I did learn about research methods, but mostly that was looking down a microscope or in a test tube rather than clinical trials with patients. Our fourth year students are leaving university with all of these skills equipped to deal with the general public and with patients to understand their needs and ensure that they're getting the right treatments. So just to finish on, the place of pharmacy in the future is very much in a one-team approach, working with doctors, nursing, nurses, other pharmacists, providing person-centred and interdisciplinary healthcare. I think we do have a role in managing long-term conditions. I think we can. Um, reliably, and I've demonstrated through evidence that we can, at least as well as uh, is done now, pharmacists can take on that role and arguably do better. I think we can harness technology to individualise health solutions across the country, but only as part of that integrated team and sharing information. So, thank you for your time. Another remarkable lecture. Thank you, uh, Jeff. I uh, am a, I'm a user of community pharmacy uh, in this respect, and I can confirm that uh, it's a fantastic uh, way to deliver medic medications. Our last speaker is Professor John Fraser. John Fraser is Dean of the Faculty of Medical Sciences at the University of Auckland, formerly head of the School of Medical Sciences. He is a graduate of Victoria University and gained a PhD in biochemistry from Auckland University in 1983. Following postdoctoral research in, into immunology at Harvard University, he returned to New Zealand as the inaugural Wellcome Trust UK Senior Fellow in Medical Science. He received a personal chair in molecular medicine in 2000 and was made a Fellow of the Royal Society of New Zealand in 2005 for his work on super antigens. John has a long-standing interest in immunity and infectious diseases, and particularly the mechanisms of virulence and pathogenicity of gram-positive organisms. He's published over 150 peer-reviewed publications and books, and has supervised 35 postgraduate and doctoral students. John is a strong advocate for the role of science in society and the importance of research-led teaching in medical education. His lecture tonight is entitled New Initiatives in Rheumatic Fever, and I think he's also going to tell us about superbugs. John Fraser. Ena mana nareo, ena hawefa tena koto. Tenakoto, uh, tenakoto katoa. Thank you, Alan. Uh, slightly long-winded introduction. I think that was taken from a bio I had many years ago. And, um, uh, yes, I am indeed the Dean of the Faculty, and it's my very great pleasure to pretty much 
finish this wonderful lecture series that we've had as part of our 50th uh, anniversary celebrations. Um, before I start, I'd just like to acknowledge all the work that's gone into this lecture series and the work that the distinguished Professor Ian Reid has uh, put into what I have believe has been an outstanding lecture series and tonight's lectures, uh, uh, notwithstanding my lecture, which I haven't given yet, I think have been outstanding. Um, and I hope that I can uh, at least express a little bit of my interest in a field which uh, I feel doesn't get a lot of attention um, in New Zealand, uh, infectious disease, uh, but it is e equally important and of course I'm, hopefully I will be able to convey some of that importance to you tonight. So uh, although my talk is entitled uh, New Initiatives in Rheumatic Fever, it really is only a part of my talk. I'm really going to talk about a more general uh, topic and that is superbugs. Uh, superbugs have always been an, an interest to me. They are a fascination, uh, maybe somewhat ghoulish fascination because they do cause a great deal of concern. Uh, they are the cause of a considerable disease, uh, quite disparate diseases across New Zealand. And of course, uh, in this country, we have a very significant uh, disparity in uh, the diseases that these bugs cause between Maori and Pacific, particularly in our young, uh, as opposed to non-Maori and non-Pacific. Uh, and rheumatic fever is a very, very good example of how, as a country, we still have a major third world disease problem, which has essentially been eradicated in other countries, first world countries such as the UK, North America and Europe. Both Australia and New Zealand have a very significant problem still in the high rates of rheumatic fever that occur in our young Maori and Pacific uh, children. So what is a superbug? A uh, superbug is not every bug. Uh, there are some very nasty bugs out there that cause very serious illness, but they're not superbugs because they're easily treated. Uh, uh, you can uh, drink uh, foul water, estuarine water, and end up with cholera. Uh, caused by an organism that, that lives in the water. Uh, you'd probably find it in the estuary of, of Auckland. Uh, but it's not a superbug because cholera is very easy to treat. It's easy to identify and it doesn't occur in, in uh, epidemics or pandemics. Uh, superbugs really are characterised by bugs that are able to change their makeup, their genetic makeup, to resist any attempt to try and destroy them. Of course, we all know that antibiotics uh, have been the mainstay of the treatment of organisms, such as the ones I'm going to talk about tonight. Uh, but at the, uh, those antibiotics are beginning to fail more and more. And of course, just recently you will have noted, those of you who have been uh, listening to the news, uh, the, the appearance of a new form of drug-resistant uh, enterococci in New Zealand, which is essentially resistant to all major forms of antibiotics. Uh, and uh, that organism is essentially here to stay. Although it's in a relatively small number of our population, it will continue to grow over the decades, and the question is how fast will it grow and how much uh, disease it will cause that will, we will be unable to treat with our current uh, repertoire of antibiotics. So superbugs typically are recognised by their ability to, uh, to resist antibiotics. They are very difficult to treat. I'm going to talk about one organism in particular, which is probably the most difficult to treat. Uh, they have high rates of community transmission, which means that they are in the community already. Um, people in this room will be carrying these bugs uh, without knowing it, and for most of us, they don't actually cause any illness. It's when they, the immunity barrier is broken down and those bugs are able to establish a, a colony or an infection uh, within the body and then that infection is not controlled by our immune response that it then becomes a florid infection and causes very serious disease and often death. Uh, they are the constant cause of disease, the ones that I'm going to talk about, these two organisms here, Staph aureus, I'm sure you've heard of Staph aureus and Strep pyogenes, uh, constantly cause disease in New Zealand and this one in particular causes a widespread variety of diseases and is the organism which probably is best suited to change its genetic makeup to be uh, resistant to pretty much all forms of antibiotics. And of course, New Zealand, we are unique. We have certain strains that uh, are prevalent in this country that you don't see in other countries, which makes it slightly more difficult to develop strategies to combat uh, these particular strains. This organism here is another gram-positive organism. It's called Strep pyogenes. It typically lives in the throat, uh, in the nasal passages, and sometimes lives on the skin. It's a, another gram-positive organism, and this is the one that causes rheumatic fever, but it also causes a number of other conditions. 
So this is really just a, a, a summary of some of the nasty conditions that these organisms cause. Staph aureus uh, causes a number of, uh, this is probably the most uh, common, these two here, uh, abscesses and impetigo, they're predominantly skin infections. The organism gets under the, the upper layers of the skin and causes an infection. So in here you'll have a small colony of Staph aureus growing and you can see the immune response around this is becoming quite prevalent so it becomes hot uh, and hot to touch, very sensitive. And that simply means that your immune response is trying to rid the body of that growing colony of Staph aureus. The problem, of course, is that organism has defence mechanisms to stop your immune, immune response from working. And in individuals where that immune response fails, that organism can then become systemic. It can get into the bloodstream and you can uh, experience a very severe, often fatal condition called septicemia, staphylococcal septicemia. In Petigo, we see on children, it's really just a skin infection which is relatively easy to treat. But the way in which we treat it has caused a very significant problem, which I'm going to talk about in the next upcoming slides. Toxic shock, a relatively rare condition which is caused by Staph aureus. Not limited to humans, cows get mastitis, that's also caused by Staph aureus. But the strains that cause mastitis are different from the strains that infect humans and cause disease. Cellulitis is really a more severe form of this where the organism has started to spread into the, uh, the um, lower forms of part of the skin and into the soft tissue underneath and into the muscle. And that is a very, very severe condition and if left untreated, uh, the patient is very likely to die. This is the guy that worries us the most. It's called MRSA. MRSA stands for methicillin resistant Staph aureus. And it's a strain of bacteria which has become very prevalent worldwide, which is really the poster child for superbug. It is the one, drug, uh, the one organism that be has become very difficult to treat. And of course, the rates of MRSA infection in New Zealand are becoming uh, increasingly uh, problematic, particularly those infections that occur in what we refer to as community acquired. So they occur out in the community rather than in the hospital. Hospital acquired infections are slightly different from those that occur in the community setting, such as aged care facilities, well, and those community acquired infections are often much more difficult to treat. But this little uh, bug here, MRSA, is a major cause of uh, morbidity and mortality worldwide now in the US. Uh, a very, very severe problem. And it's got that way because it's become resistant to the mainstay of antibiotics, which are the penicillin-based antibiotics, of which methicillin is a classic form. Uh, we have high antibiotic, uh, high antibiotic resistance in Staph aureus, and of course uh, the problem is, is that it has a very high uh, uh, asymptomatic carriage, which means about 20 to 30 percent of the people in this room at the moment are carrying Staph aureus in the upper areas, the uh, uh, anterior narrows of the nose up in here. Uh, so it's a very, very easy to spread. This organism is the one that causes uh, rheumatic fever, strep pyogenes, and rheumatic heart disease. You're probably familiar with strep throat. I'm sure many of you have had a strep throat. Often really easy to distinguish between a standard viral infection because it hurts like mad. Uh, and that be that's because your tonsils swell up to such a size that you can really have, uh, it's almost impossible to to swallow, but of course you get a systemic effects, you get a high fever, you feel very unwell, and that's because the organism growing in these tonsils is releasing these virulence factors which are causing quite significant systemic effects that make you feel very unwell. Also causes scarlet fever, uh, less common in New Zealand than it used to be, uh, like rheumatic fever. Uh, this is a particularly nasty form of strep infection where it's got into the soft tissue and into the muscle. Uh, cellulitis and necrotizing fasciitis, often referred to as flesh-eating bacteria. The only solution here is really amputation because the soft tissue has really just been destroyed by this infection. And rheumatic fever uh, is uh, one of the uh, significant problems that we have in New Zealand because it is a disease of poverty and overcrowding. So most of the ca cases of rheumatic fever in New Zealand are associated with young Maori and Pacific children who live in uh, low socioeconomic areas such as South Auckland uh, and uh, other areas uh, where the transmission rates of this organism are very high and the treatment rates are very low uh, and uh, often the condition is left until the rheumatic fever has developed to a point where there's been permanent damage uh, done to the heart valves of the, uh, the valves of the heart. Thankfully, strep 
pyogenes is still fully sensitive to penicillin. So it's relatively easy to treat. You just give a dose of penicillin, and within 24 to 48 hours, the, uh, the infection has, uh, has been eradicated. Um, I rue the day when we discover an antibiotic uh, version, resistant version of strep pyogenes. I hope I'm not around when that day comes. So MRSA is the classic poster child of, of the superbug uh, family, methicillin resistant Staph aureus. We know it arose uh, sometime in the 1970s from Brazil. We have records that date back that way, and of course now with genetic techniques and careful screening, we can go back and look at the genomes of the organisms that arose. Uh, so it often is associated with infections in the lung and on the skin. It causes uh, inflammation of the heart muscle uh, bone and joints, and also causes, particularly in the US for some reason, a very severe, severe form of necrotizing pneumonia. So it gets into the lungs and it starts to eat away the lung tissue, and that's a very, very severe infection. So half of staphylococcal infections in the USA now are due to methicillin-resistant staph aureus, and they are resistant to penicillin, methicillin, tetracycline, and erythromycin. So really, they've only the only way you can treat them is with uh, long treatment, uh, severe antibiotics, antibiotics that are only used as last resort. Community acquired MRSA is on the rise in New Zealand quite significantly and it is a problem. One of the great mysteries of course is that some people uh, develop MRSA uh, and it only forms a mild treatable skin infection whereas others succumb to a very severe invasive form and it's almost impossible to treat. For those of you who, are, who understand microbial genomics and genetics, uh, the classic strain in the US is called USA 300. It has some certain uh, prototype genetic uh, features uh, uh, that we refer to, and these are often we, what we look for when we screen uh, in new infections in New Zealand to see if uh, this uh, prototype MRSA has made its way to New Zealand shores. Um, and really one of the great questions is what is it about this strain which makes it so infectious? It's not just that it's able to resist methicillin, it carries a gene which actually destroys penicillin-based antibiotics. Uh, that's not the reason why it's uh, so severe. And we still don't understand why an infection of MRSA causes such uh, invasive, uh, difficult to treat. Well, of course it's difficult to treat because it doesn't respond to antibiotics, but. Uh, the types of infections that cause are uh, particularly severe. So I'm going to get to the New Zealand uh, uh, situation now, and this is research that was done uh, by uh, a group, uh, particularly uh, by a PhD student who was working in our group uh, uh, in the, uh, from uh, 2012 through 2015, Deb Williamson. And this is really a study which looks at what types of Staph aureus clones are appearing in New Zealand and what are the predominant disease-causing strains? Now, I realise that this is probably a complex slide. It's not meant to be. It's really just to reflect that Debbie uh, looked uh, at over 3,000 disease-causing strains or clones that have been isolated from various patients around New Zealand, and she did a genetic analysis of all of those clones. And she dis uh, was discovered that, in fact, 36% uh, of them, and this was across the entire population in New Zealand, we're represented by only three particular uh, unique clones, one, two, and three. And here are their spar types. This is just a way in which we identify. And you can see that each of the three clones are different. Uh, this, this particular clone, which is the most common, thankfully is still sensitive to methicillin. This is methicillin-sensitive Staph aureus, which means it's still easy to treat with standard antibiotics. Uh, this is also sensitive, but this one here, MRSA, is resistant to penicillin-based antibiotics. The most important discovery that Deb made was the fact that each of these three strains was resistant to another antibiotic called fusidic acid. So 36% of the strains in New Zealand are now fusidic acid resistant. Now fusidic acid is not a particularly important antibiotic in the hospital setting. We don't use it in the hospitals. We use penicillins and tetracycline and erythromycin, all the powerful antibiotics. Fusidic acid is an antibiotic that's used particularly to treat mild skin infections. So most of you will have had a skin infection where you've gone to the general practitioner and he's prescribed an ointment where you rub on the infection and that treats it. And that's usually fusidic acid. 20 years ago, these three clones did not exist in New Zealand. So where did they come from and why? Well, the simple fact is that 20 years ago, uh, January 1998, 
Fusidic acid was first prescribed as a treatment for skin infections. And this is the prescription rates of fusidic acid in New Zealand. You can see a steady climb. Uh, so this is community dispensing rates per 1,000 population per month is now up to, by January uh, 2012, and this has continued to climb. This is a tube of Foban. I looked in our cabinet at home, and we have a tube of Foban sitting in the cabinet. Uh, this is fusidic acid. So the reason why these three clones have appeared, and these are three very difficult to treat clones, is because we've been using fusidic acid too much. It's been used, prescribed for skin infections, that has caused the uh, Staph aureus on our skins to develop fusidic acid resistance, and that has caused the um, establishment of this, these uh, three strains, and now have, they have become the predominant disease-causing strains in New Zealand. So this is a clear lesson in how overprescription of antibiotics for really treatments that probably could have been treated in other ways has led to a very significant problem. This is a lesson in how fast antibiotic selection and resistance can occur in a population such as New Zealand. Uh, this is another antibiotic, mupirocin, which is also used for skin infection. And interestingly, the rates of prescription have stayed relatively the same. In fact, they've gone down a bit. So really, the reason why this has increased was really marketing. Drug companies have marketed this to general practitioners. General practitioners have seen patients who've had a mild skin infection. The practitioner has decided, well, I'm not going to test to see if it's Staph aureus or something else. I'll just prescribe Foban, uh, and you can get it across the counter as well. And people have uh, used it, and the consequence has been that within about 20 years, we've got three strains which are all resistant to fusidic acid. So that is a lesson in, uh, in how quickly antibiotics can cause these very significant and very problematic strains to appear and they're now essentially here to stay. So one of the questions we have, and I'm an immunologist by trade, is, is whether vaccines are a logical solution to treating uh, antibiotic resistance, because of course antibiotic resistance has been around for millions of years. Uh, bacteria, uh, antibiotics essentially have come from fungi. Fungi get uh, infections just like we do, and fungi over millions of years have produced these molecules which interact and destroy the bacteria or destroy the ability of the bacteria to grow. We've used these compounds for the last 60 years very effectively, but of course they're starting to fail us. So what is the other solution? Well, the only other solution we have, uh, because infectious disease is not going to go away, is to look at vaccine approaches, because vaccines are still very effective in treating uh, infectious disease. However, with Staph aureus, it's been a bit of a problem because Staph aureus also doesn't respond particularly well to uh, uh, Staph vaccines. That's not to say that I don't believe Staph, uh, a vaccine for Staph aureus mightn't work. It's just that uh, the number of vaccines that have been tried clinically have all failed. And this is really just a reflection of the failure of a number of very important vaccines that were developed, these two by a company called Navi. Uh, Staph vax failed, uh, even though it showed very good promise uh, in animal studies, uh, the, uh, the Staph vax, which is based on a cell surface molecule on the surface of, of Staph aureus, really showed no effect uh, in clinical trials. And they modified that, and that was also failed and shelved. Another vaccine that was tested in clinical trials around the world uh, called Pagimaxabab Mab, uh, was failed. It really didn't show any efficacy. Uh, another company, Inhibitex, Orexis uh, produced another vaccine, uh, which again failed in clinical trials. And the most uh, publicly, um, uh, or the one that caused the greatest uh, interest was this very uh, publicly touted vaccine called V7110 by the company Merck, <clears throat> which looked like it was really going to work. All the animal studies uh, appeared to be very effective. It was based on a single molecule on the surface of Staph aureus called the ISDB protein, which is on all strains of Staph aureus. And in animal studies, it looked like if you're vaccinated with this particular protein and got good antibodies against it, then the animals were entirely protected from, from uh, infection by Staph aureus. So it went into phase two and phase three clinical studies, particularly in the US in cardiac units, where cardiac units have problems with uh, staphylococcal infections. Most surgical units have problems with the staph aureus infections, but cardiac units are in particular notable for the problem in having uh, post-surgical infections due to staph aureus. 
uh, the trial was uh, ended when it was discovered that the vaccine actually increased the death rate uh, amongst those who were vaccinated by a factor of five-fold. So that told us that vaccines don't always work. In fact, they do quite the opposite. They actually enhance the ability of the organism to grow because the vaccine we now know actually protected the organism rather than caused it to um, be more susceptible to immune attack. Unsurprisingly, that uh, study was halted immediately. Uh, has that put an end to vaccines for Staph aureus? I don't believe so, and certainly my group uh, has a real interest in developing alternative vaccines which don't actually work the same way as that, uh, that Merck vaccine, uh, based on uh, virulence factors that we know through a lot of work that we've done are uh, very, very important in the initial colonisation of tissue by Staph aureus. So the idea is that by vaccinating with these uh, immobilised virulence factors, uh, there is a quite unique to Staph aureus, that you can develop an antibody response that then protects the patient from further infection from colonisation. So my vision is that a vaccine will be useful in all surgical settings. Pe people who are going in for um, elective surgery or cardiac surgery uh, would be vaccinated uh, two to three weeks or a month before the surgery uh, so that they are at less risk of developing that uh, post-surgical infection, which is such a problem around the world. Uh, so we are actively working on this and we have a, a, a project grant from the Health Research Council to develop such a vaccine. Uh, so I did want to talk a little bit about rheumatic fever. It is still a problem in New Zealand. Uh, we are working very uh, hard to develop strategies to uh, deal with rheumatic fever. Uh, you are probably aware that over the past 10 years we've had a very major program uh, run by the Ministry of Health uh, which was really to uh, screen a primary prevention program in high-risk areas where young people, if they had a sore throat, they would be uh, seen by the, the uh, public health nurse in the school. The nurse would swab the throat and give prophylactic antibiotics to those children who uh, presented with a sore throat. It was a very expensive exercise. I think the uh, government spent about $80 million in total on this prevention program. And it was really to try and stop the infection of the throat by strep pyogenes before it occurred, using penicillin as the prophylactic antibiotic. I have to say that it wasn't particularly successful because the, uh, the rates of transmission in those communities is too high, and unless you get every single child that is carrying uh, strep pyogenes, then really a primary prevention program, uh, as expensive as it is to run, really does not provide the efficacy. In small communities, it's been shown to work uh, because you can get every child in that community. But in larger communities such as South Auckland, unless you vaccinate every child at risk, uh, sorry, if you treat every child with penicillin, uh, prophylactically over a long period of time, those rates of rheumatic fever are not going to go away or are not going to reduce. So uh, we have been working with our colleagues in Australia um, to look at the development of a vaccine for strep pyogenes. Uh, this is a little bit more developed than the vaccine for, staph, uh, for staph aureus. And this is really just a slide looking at all of the partners that are involved in this very significant program which has been named CANVAS, it's the Coalition uh, to Develop Novel Vaccines Against Strep Pyogenes. It's primarily involved uh, ourselves, the University of Auckland, uh, myself and Jonathan Karapetis, who's the director of the Telethon Institutes and Kids. It was really started by uh, former Prime Minister John Key, who asked uh, me one day at a meeting, what would it take to develop a vaccine against strep pyogenes? I said, $10 million. Uh, and he went away and said, well, I'll see what I can do. So he then spoke to the Prime Minister of Australia at that time and they developed a program which uh, was funded on both sides of the Tasman to look at fast tracking uh, vaccines. Uh, that was uh, four years ago and after a lot of work we've uh, identified a number of vaccines that we think should be uh, likely uh, uh, ripe for clinical trials. And the one that we are looking at most seriously is this a vaccine that's been developed by a company, GlaxoSmithKline, which is a complex vaccine which has been well developed through their uh, developmental program. It's a, a vaccine which is, has four components to it, and we've been working very closely with GSK with the intention of a, a clinical trial uh, beginning in Australia and New Zealand, hopefully within the next two years. So the, the vaccine is currently under uh, development to GMP manufacturing stage. And at that stage, we're hoping that uh, New Zealand and Australia will be the first sites for this uh, clinical trial 
for this vaccine. Uh, that's not to ignore the fact that, that uh, Associate Professor Thomas Proft in Auckland here is also developing an alternative vaccine based on another a potential antigen, which I think also has significant uh, development. So there's a lot of work going on looking at a vaccine approach. Uh, my future for New Zealand and Australia will be that uh, simple vaccination of children at risk. And we know where these children are. They're in South Auckland, they're in Porirua, they're in uh, the um, uh, western part of the North Island and, and Northland. Uh, they're in schools, we can identify them and we can vaccinate them relatively easily. So uh, we are hoping that, uh, that the, uh, the trials that are due to be started within the next two years will show that this vaccine is at least some way efficacious in reducing the rates of uh, streptococcal infection that would suggest that it will also be effective in reducing the rates of rheumatic fever in this country. So I've presented a somewhat uh, grim tale of antibiotic resistance and superbugs, uh, my two favourite organisms, strep, pyogenes and staph aureus. There is really no solution yet, uh, uh, particularly in rheumatic fever with strep pyogenes. But there is a shining light in all of this. Uh, you're probably all, all worried, like everybody else, about antibiotic resistance and the development of superbugs and what we're going to do about it. Uh, the one problem we have is that over the last 60 years, there have been no new antibiotics that have been developed. All the antibiotics that have been developed are different modifications of the same old antibiotic. So the classic penicillin that was first discovered by Alexander Fleming has simply been modified over and over again to try and overcome the resistance that's developed against it. So most of the antibiotics that are used today are still based on what we refer to as the lactam antibiotic molecule. That's been a problem, of course, because we haven't discovered any new types of antibiotics. Just recently, however, and this was a very celebrated paper that occurred in Nature, was a very clever fellow called Kim Lewis decided to look for organisms that had never been seen before. Uh, and what he did was he made this little cell and he planted it in mud in his back garden. Uh, and in these cells, he made the summary that the organisms that they'd never seen before would only grow under the conditions that they were used to, i.e. in mud. And so he actually cultured these things in these cells uh, in the conditions that they were most used to growing. And he discovered this new organism called Eleftheria teri, teri being earth. And it produced a new compound called Tichiobactin. And this is the compound, for those of you who are interested in molecular structure, it looks nothing like the lactams. It's a completely new structure. And it is very powerful against all gram-positive organisms, including MRSA and vancomycin-resistant staph aureus. So this is a real shining light for the future. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of work going on now to try and, and repeat these, this work in other areas uh, to identify other new organisms that are producing other very interesting antibiotic molecules that in theory should have no resistance against them because they are so completely new and quite rare. So with that, I'd like to finish. I'd like to thank you all for coming along tonight. And uh, I guess now is the time for a few questions. We are out of time. So I would like to just acknowledge that uh, over the years we've had uh, very generous support from the Health Research Council uh, and of course the Morris Wilkins Centre that I've been a member of for many years. And of course the Canvas uh, funding that we received from both Australia and New Zealand has really supported a lot of the research that we've done over the last 10 years. Thank you. Thank you, John. I think that was a remarkable final closing lecture in this 50th anniversary series of lectures. Uh, we do have gifts for the, uh, uh, for the speakers. Uh, I think we've had remarkable uh, presentations tonight, all of them. Very professional, very interesting, and very varied. But I think more importantly than the gifts, if you could join me in again expressing our appreciation for what I think has just been four fantastic presentations. I'd also like to thank Jasmine Barber for the uh, organization. Where, where are you, Jasmine? Oh, there you are at the top. For the organization tonight. Thank you for that. And again, thank you all for coming. Ehui pai, he kōra pai, ko te mea nui 
kamatu pai. Hoki pai atu ki te kianga. Norera tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katā. Good night to all of you.